All right, I'm sitting in my car. We're gonna read until it gets dark here. Um, Love in the Time of Cholera, chapter six, top of 293. Florentina Ariza did not even refer to the terrible letter that she had sent him, but from the very beginning, he attempted a new method of seduction without any reference to past loves or even to the past itself, a clean slate. Instead, he wrote an extensive meditation of, on life based on his ideas about and experience of relations between men and women, which at one time he had intended to write as a compliment to the lover's companion. Only now he disguised it in the patriarchal style of an old man's memories so that it would not be too obvious that it was really a document of love. First, he wrote many drafts in his old style, which he took longer to read, which took longer to read with a cool head than throw into the fire. But he knew that any conventional slip, the slightest nostalgic indiscre indiscretion, could revive the unpleasant taste of the past in her heart. And although he foresaw her returning to, uh, returning a hundred letters to him before he dared open the first, he preferred that it did not happen even once. And so he planned everything down to the last detail as if it were the final battle. New intrigues, new hopes in a woman who had already lived a full and complete life. It had to be a mad dream. One that would give her the courage she would need to discard the prejudice prejudices of a class that had not always been hers, but had become hers more than anyone's. It had to teach her to think of love as a state of grace, not the means to anything, but the alpha and omega, an end in itself. He had the good sense not to expect it, an immediate reply, to be satisfied if the letter w was not returned to him. It was not, nor were any of the ones that followed, and as the days passed, his excitement grew for the more days that passed without her letters being returned, the greater his hope of a reply. In the beginning, the frequency of his letters was conditioned by the dexterity of his fingers, first one a week, then two, and at last one a day. He was happy about the progress made in the mail service since his days as a standard bearer, for he would not have risked seeing every day being seen every day in the post office mailing a letter to the same person, or sending it with someone who might talk. On the other hand, it was very easy to send an employee to buy enough stamps for a month and then slip the letter into one of the three mailboxes located in the old city. He soon, soon made that ritual a part of his routine. He took advantage of his insomnia to write, and the next day, on his way to the office, he would ask the driver to stop for a moment at a corner box, and he would get out the and to mail the letter. He never allowed the chauffeur to do it for him, as he attempted to do one rainy morning, and at times he took the precaution of carrying several letters rather than just one so that it would seem more natural. The chauffeur did not know, of course, that the additional letters were blank pages that Florentino was addressed to himself, for he had never carried on a private correspondence with anyone with the exception of the Guardian's report that he sent at the end of each month to the parents of America Vicuña, with his personal impressions of the girl's conduct, her state of mind and health, and the progress she was making in her studies. After the first month, he began to number the letters and to head them with a synopsis of the, pr of the previous one, as in the serialized novels in the newspapers, for fear that Fermina Daza would not realize that they had a certain continuity. When they became daily letters, moreover, he replaced the envelopes that had morning vignettes with long white envelopes, and this gave them the added impersonality of business letters. When he began, he was prepared to subject his patients to a crucial test, at least until he had proof that he was wasting his time with the, <coughs> with the only new approach he could think of. <coughs> Excuse me. He waited, in fact, not with the many kinds of suffering that waited had caused him in his youth, but with the stubbornness of an old man made of stone who had nothing else to think about, nothing else to do in a riverboat company that by this time was sailing without his help for favorable winds, and who was also convinced that he would be alive and in perfect possession of his male fa faculties the next day, or the day after that, or whenever Fermina Daza at last was convinced that there was no other remedy f for her solitary widow's yearning than to lower the drawbridge for him. Meanwhile, he continued with his normal life. In anticipation of a favorable reply, he began a second renovation of his house so that it would be worthy of the woman who could have considered herself its lady and mistress from the day of its purchase. He visited Prudencia Pitre again several times, as he had promised, in order to prove to her that he loved her despite the devastation wrought by age, 
loved her in full sunlight and with the doors open, and not only on his nights of desolation. He continued to pass by Andrea Varon's house until he found the bathroom light turned off, and he tried to lose himself in the wildness of her bed, even though it was only so he would not lose the habit of love. In keeping with another of his superstitions, not disproved so far, that the body carries on for as long as you do. His relations with America Vicuña were the only difficulty. He had repeated the order to his chauffeur to pick her up on Saturdays at ten o'clock in the morning at the school, but he did not know what to do with her on, but during the weekends. For the first time, he did not concern himself with her, and he resent and she resented the change. He placed her in the care of the servant girls and had them take her to the afternoon film, to the band concerts in the children's park, to the charity bazaars, or he arranged Sunday activities for her and her classmates so that he would not have to take her to the hidden paradise behind his offices to which she had always wanted to return after that first time he took her there. In the fog of his new illusion, he did not realize that women can become adults in three days, and that three years ago had three years had gone by since he had met her boat from Puerto Padre, Puerto Padre. No matter how he tried to soften the blow, it was a brutal change for her, and she could not imagine the reason for it. On the day in the ice cream parlor, when he told her he was going to marry, when he revealed the truth to her, she had reeled with panic. But then the possibility seemed so absurd that she forgot about it. In a very short while, however, she realized that she that he was behaving with inex inexplicable evasiveness. As if it was true. As if he were not six years older than she, but sixty years younger. One Saturday afternoon, Florentino Ariza found her trying to type in his bedroom, and she was doing rather well, for she was studying typing at school. She had completed more than half a page of automatic writing, but it was not difficult to isolate an occasional phrase that revealed her state of mind. Florentino Ariza leaned over her shoulder to read what she had written. She was disturbed by his man's heat by his ragged breathing, by the scent of his clothes, which was the same as the scent on his pillow. She was no longer the little girl, the newcomer, whom he had undressed one article of clothing at a time, with little baby games. First, these little shoes for the little baby bear, then this little chemise for the little puppy dog, next these little flowered panties for the little bunny rabbit, and a little kiss on her papa's delicious little dickety bird. Ugh, gross. Um, no, now she was a full-fledged woman who liked to take the initiative. She continued typing with just one finger of her right hand, and with her left, she felt for his leg, explored him, found him, felt him come to life, grow, heard him sigh with excitement, and his old man's breathing became uneven and labored. She knew him from that point on he was going to lose control. His speech would become disjointed. He would be at her mercy, and he would not find his way back until he had reached the end. She led him by the hand to the bed, as if he were a blind beggar on the street, and she cut him into pieces with malicious tenderness. She added salt to taste, pepper, a clove of garlic, chopped an onion, lemon juice, bay leaf, until he was seasoned on the platter and the oven was heated to the right temperature. There was no one in the house. The servant girls had gone out, and the ma masons and carpenters who were renovating the house did not work on Saturday. They had the whole world to themselves. But on the edge of the abyss, he came out of his ecstasy, moved her hand away, sat up, and said in a tremulous voice, Be careful, we have no rubbers. She lay back on, in bed for a long time, thinking, and when she returned to school an hour early, she was beyond all desire to cry, and she had sharpened her sense of smell along with her claws so that she could track down the miserable whore who had ruined her life. Florentino Ariza, on the other hand, made another masculine misjudgment. He believed that she had been convinced of the futility of her desires and had resolved to forget him. He was back in his element. At the end of six months, he had heard nothing at all, and he found himself tossing and turning in bed until dawn, lost in the wasteland of a new kind of insomnia. He thought that Fermina Daza had opened the first letter because of its appearance, had seen the initial she knew from the letters of long ago, and had thrown it out to be burned with the rest of the trash without even taking the trouble to tear it up. Just seeing the envelopes of those that followed would be enough for her to do the same without even opening them, and to continue to do so until the end of time, while he came at last to his final written meditation. He did not believe that the woman existed 
who could resist her curiosity about half a year of almost daily letters, when she did not even know the color of ink they were written in. But if such a woman existed, it had to be her. Top of 297. Florentino Ruiza felt that his old age was not a rushing torrent, but a bottomless cistern where his memory drained away. His ingen ingenuity was ingenuity, kind of like ingenue, um, was wearing thin. After patrolling the villa in La Manga for several days, he realized that this strategy from his youth, youth would never break down the doors sealed by morning. One morning, as he was looking for a number in the telephone directory, he happened to come across hers. He called. It rang many times, and at last he recognized her grave, husky voice. Hello? He hung up without speaking, but the infinite distance of that unapproachable voice weakened his morale. It was at this time that Leona Cassiani celebrated her birthday and invited a small group of friends to her house. He was distracted and spilled chicken gravy on himself. She cleaned his lapel with the corner of his neck dampened in a glass of water and then she tied it around his neck like a bib to avoid a more serious accident he looked like an old baby she noticed that several times during dinner he took off his eyeglasses and dried them with his handkerchief because his eyes were watering during coffee he fell asleep holding his cup in his hand and she tried to take it away without waking him but his embarrassed response was i was just resting my eyes Leona Cassiani went to bed astounded at how his age was beginning to show. On the first anniversary of the death of Juvenal Urbino, the family sent out invitations to a memorial mass at the cathedral. Florentino Ariza had still received no reply, and this was the driving force behind his boldest decision to attend the mass, although he had not been invited. It was a social event more ostentatious than emotional. The first few rows of peers were reserved for their lifetime owners, whose names were engraved on copper nameplates on the backs of their seats. Florentino Rizzo was among the first to arrive, so he might sit where Fermina Daza could not pass by without seeing him. He thought that the best seats would be in the center nave, central nave, behind the reserved views. But there were so many people, he could not find a seat there either, and he had to sit in the nave of poor relations. From there, he saw Fermina Daza walk in on her son's arm, dressed in an unadorned, unadorned long-sleeved black velvet dress buttoned all the way from her neck to the tips of her shoes, like a bishop's cassock, and a narrow, narrow scarf of Castilian lace instead of the veiled hat worn by other widows, and even by many other ladies who longed for that condition. <laughs> uh, her uncovered face shone like alabaster, her lancelet eyes had a life of their own under the enormous chandeliers of the central nave. And as she walked, she was so erect, so haughty, so self-possessed, that she seemed no older than her son. As he stood, Florentino Ariza leaned the tips of his finger fingers against the back of the pew until his dizziness passed. For he felt that he and she were not separated by seven paces, but existed in two different times. Though almost the entire ceremony, Fermina Daza stood in the family pew in front of the main altar, as elegant as when she attended the opera. But when it was over, she broke with convention and did not stay in her seat, according to the custom of the day, to receive the spiritual renewal of condolences, but made her way instead through the crowd to thank each one of the guests, an innovative gesture that was very much, very much in harmony with her style and character. Greeting one guest after another, she at last reached the pews of the poor relations, and then she looked around to make certain she had not missed anyone she knew. At that moment, Florentino Ariza felt a supernatural wind lifting him out of himself. She had seen him. Fermina Daza moved away from her companions with the same assurance she brought to everything in society, held out her hand, and with a very sweet smile said to him, Thank you for coming. For... She had not only received his letters, she had read them with great interest and had found them in them serious and thoughtful reasons to go on living. She had been at the table having breakfast with her daughter when she received the first one. She opened it because of the novelty of its being typewritten, and a sudden blush burned her face when she recognized the initial of the signature. But she immediately regained her self-possession and put the letter in her apron pocket. She said, it is a condolence letter from the government. 
Her daughter was surprised. All of them came already. She was imper imperturbable. Imperturbable. Yeah. This is another one. Her intention was to burn the letter later, when she was away from her daughter's questions. But she could not resist the temptation of looking over it first. She expected the reply that her insulting letter deserved, a letter that she began to regret the very moment she sent it. But from the majestic salutation and the subject of the first paragraph, she realized that something had changed in the world. She was so intrigued that she locked herself in her bedroom to read it at her ease before she burned it, and she read it three times without pausing. It was a meditation on life, love, old age, death, ideas that had often fluttered around her head like nocturnal birds, but dissolved into a trickle of feathers when she tried to catch hold of them. There they were, precise, simple, just as she would have liked to say them, and once again she grieved that her husband was not alive to discuss them with her as they used to discuss certain events of the day before going to sleep. In this way, an unknown Florentino Ariza was revealed to her, one possessed of clear-sightedness that in no way corresponds to the feverish love letters of his youth or to the somber conduct of his entire life. They were, rather, the words of a man who, in the opinion of Aunt Escarlastica, was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and this thought astounded her now as much as it had the first time. In any case, what most calmed her spirit was the certainty that this letter from a wise old man was not an attempt to repeat the impertinence of the last of the night of the vigil over the body, but a very noble way of erasing the past. Middle of 299. The letters that followed brought her complete calm. Still, she burned them after reading them with a growing interest, although burning them left her with a sense of guilt that she could not dissipate. So that when they began to be numbered, she found the moral justification she had been seeking for not destroying them. At any rate, her initial intention was not to keep them for herself, but to wait for an opportunity to return them to Florentino Riva so that something that seemed of great human value would not be lost. The difficulty was that time passed and the letters continued to arrive, one every three or four days throughout the year, and she did not know how to return them without that appearing to be the rebuff she no longer wanted to give, and without having to explain everything in a letter that her pride would not permit her to write. That first year had been enough time for her to adjust to her widowhood. The purified memory of her husband no longer an obstacle in her daily actions, in her private thoughts, in her simplest intentions, became a watchful presence that guided but did not hinder her. On the occasions when she truly needed him, she would see him, not as an apparition, but as flesh and blood. She was encouraged by the certainty that he was there, still alive, but without his masculine whims, his patriarchal demands, his consuming need for her to love him in the same ritual of inopportune kisses and tender words with which he loved her. For now, she understood him better than when he was alive. She understood the yearning of his love, the urgent need to be felt to find in her the security that seemed to be the mainstay of his public life, and that, in reality, he never possessed. One day, at the height of desperation, she had shouted at him, You don't understand how unhappy I am! Unperturbed, he took off his eyeglasses with a characteristic gesture. He flooded her with the transparent waters of his childlike eyes, and in a single phrase, he burdened her with the weight of his unbearable wisdom. Always remember that the most important thing in a good marriage is not happiness, but stability. With the first loneliness of her widowhood, she had understood that the phrase did not conceal the miserable threat that she had attributed to it at the time, but was the lodestone that had given them both so many happy hours. On her many journeys through the world, Fermina Daza had bought every object that attracted her attention because of its novelty. She desired these things with a primitive impulse that her husband was happy to rationalize, and they were beautiful, useful objects as long as they remained in their original environment, in the show windows of Rome, Paris, London, or in the New York vibrating to the Charleston, where skyscrapers were beginning to grow. But they could not withstand the test of Strauss waltzes with pork cracklings or poetic festivals when it was 90 degrees in the shade. 
and so she would return with a half dozen enormous standing trunks made of polished metal with copper locks and corners like decorated coffins, lady and mistress of the world's latest marvels, which were worth their price, not in gold, but in the fleeting moment when someone from their her local world would see them for the first time. For that is why they had been bought, so that others could see them. She became aware of her frivolous public image long before she began to grow old, and in the house she was often heard to say, we have to get rid of all these trinkets. There's no room to turn around. Dr. Rubino would laugh at her fruitless efforts, for he knew that the emptied spaces were only going to be filled again. But she persisted, because it was true that there was no room for anything else, and nothing anywhere served any purpose. Not the shirts hanging on the doorknobs or the overcoats for European winters squeezed into the kitchen cupboards. So that on a morning when she awoke in high spirits, she would raise the clothes closets, empty the trunks, tear apart the attics, and wage a war of separation against the piles of clothing that had been seen once too often. The hats she had never worn because there had been no occasion to wear them while they were still in fashion, the shoes copied by European artists from those used by empresses for their coronations, and which were scorned here by highborn ladies because they were identical to the ones that black women bought at the market to wear in the house. For the entire morning, the interior terrace would be in a state of crisis, and in the house it would be difficult to breathe because of bitter gusts from the mothballs. But in a few hours, order would be reestablished because she at last took pity on so much silk strewn on the floor. So so many leftover brocades and useless pieces of passementerie, so many silver foxtails all condemned to the fire. It is a sin to burn this, she would say, when so many people do not have enough to eat. And so the burning was postponed, it was always postponed, and things were only shifted from their places of privilege to the stables that had been transformed into storage bins for remnants, while the spaces that had been cleared just as he predicted, began to fill up again, to overflow with things that lived for a moment, and then went to die in the closets, until the next time, she would say, someone should invent something to do with things you cannot use anymore, but that you cannot throw, still cannot throw out. That was true. She was dismayed by the veracity with which objects kept invading living spaces, displacing the humans, forcing them back on, into the corners, until Fermina Daza pushed the objects out of sight, for she was not as ordered as people thought, but she did have her own desperate method for appearing to be so. She hid the disorder. The day that Juvenal Urbino died, they had to empty out half of his study and pile the things in the bedroom, so there would be space to lay out the body. Death's passage through the house brought the solution. Once she had burned her husband's clothes, Promina Daza realized that her hand had not trembled on the same impulse. She continued to light the fire at regular intervals, throwing everything on it, old and new, not thinking about the envy of the rich or the vengeance of the poor who were dying of hunger. Finally, she had the mango tree cut back at the roots until there was nothing left of that misfortune, and she gave the live parrot to the new museum of the city. Only then did she draw a free breath in the kind of house she had always dreamed of. Large, easy, and all hers. I'm going to stop there. Top of 302.